Building to start. Recording in progress. Okay, so welcome everybody to this third week of the Spring College. Um, so we'll start uh, this uh, uh, cycle of lectures on uh, quantitative viral dynamics with Joshua Weitz, who is uh, professor at uh, Georgia Tech in Atlanta and a visiting professor at ENS uh, in uh, Paris. So, Josh, thanks for being here, and the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? I have my mic on. I'm still going to wear a mask, but as long as you can hear me enunciate, I think it'll be okay. Sounds good? All right. Good morning, everyone, and wherever people are online. So I'm Joshua Weitz. I'll be giving a series of nine lectures over the course of this week and next week. And I'll try to break up my lectures into two segments. This week's lectures on viral ecology and next week on viral epidemiology, more on epidemics. And in doing so, this week I'm going to focus predominantly on the interactions between viruses and their microbial hosts. And next week I'll focus predominantly on their interactions between viruses and human hosts. And in so doing, really focus uh, on epidemics at large scales and ways that models can help and focusing predominantly on COVID-19. Okay, so that'll be next week and this week will be more on the ecological side. But since I'm new to you and I assume that every time a new lecture starts, you have to adjust a little bit to the style of the person. So I wanted to give a little uh, background introduction to myself and my group. Usually I'm based out of Atlanta, Georgia, which is in the southeast part of the United States. Very, has anyone been there to, or to the, to the airport maybe? It's a very well-known airport. Jacopo has been there, a few of you. Okay. And that's the building that we sit in. It's a block style building right in the center of the city. And originally I have a PhD in physics, but my appointment is in biology. So I really sit in biology. That's where I work. That's where most of my interests lie. And I have a courtesy appointment in physics and electrical computer engineering. And I've also started uh, a number of years ago, a new PhD program in quantitative biosciences. This is a flyer from a few years ago featuring uh, an individual from one of our first cohorts who won a, a National Science Foundation graduate fellowship. And we've had a number of cohorts since, and you can see the group size. It's usually about seven to 10 individuals applying both from the US and internationally. And it, you can start this after your master's degree or after your undergraduate degree. So if you're interested in this at some point, feel free to reach out to me, or you can look at qbios.gatech.edu. But this year, I'm based somewhere else. I'm a visiting faculty member at the Institut de Biologie at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. So if you're nearby and you want to talk about viruses, just let me know, and I'll be there until about early July. And I'm also doing schools like this, so that this is uh, really a college, and I view what I'm about to do in two weeks as an advanced school, winter school. It's a one-week course and I bring it to your attention because it's on the same theme, quantitative viral dynamics. I'm just giving one lecture there because I'm the organizer, and there's a number of uh, lecturers who are coming from all over the world to give lectures in this course. So if you get interested in this topic, I, ha I am hoping to release some of these lectures online. So you can check out the QLife website. I didn't list it here because it's you know, 75 characters long, but if you look up quantitative viral dynamics across scales, QLife, you should be able to find it and find the information. Okay, great. So in my group at Georgia Tech and now based here, based in Paris, we work on a number of areas that are interlinked. As I said, predominantly viral ecology and viral epidemiology. And I'm going to try to use some of those real world applications as the basis for the material that I'm gonna present this week and next week. Okay, and in doing so, I just wanted to introduce some of the people that make this work just because some of you may be already in research teams, maybe you're thinking about embarking on, on a research career, and so we have folks from all over the world, from Europe, from Asia, uh, South Asia, the US, etc. And we also have collaborators both at Georgia Tech but also internationally. So folks like Laurent de Barbieu in Paris, folks in Israel, and it really is sort of these international collaborations, which is also the spirit of the ICTP, which makes all of this work. <clears throat> 
And so I wanted to go back to these research areas, which as you can see here or on the other side or online, we tend to work on problems of the foundations of viral ecology. How is it that viruses interact with their microbial hosts? And if we're thinking about microbes, we also have to think about microbial ecology. And we have really two big application areas, one into using viruses of microbes as a potential therapeutic. And I'm, this is a bit of an overture. I'm giving you a preview of everything that's about to come this week. And we also work on trying to understand the way that viruses impact marine systems. So we care about human health and environmental health. And there are ways that viruses intersect and impinge upon both. In parallel to that, we also work on infectious disease dynamics. Questions of how do diseases and viruses in particular spread in human populations and the intersection of mathematical models with those ideas. And in doing so, I, I think we have a common approach, which is we do try to seek, and I'll, I'll send to Delbrook, this radical physical explanation of life, which I think is often the spirit of physics of living systems. But again, I'm sitting in a biology department, ecology evolution. It tends to be the centerpiece of what we're interested in. And the methodology really is one of nonlinear dynamics of complex systems. So the lectures this week and next will tend to emphasize those methods, even if based on my read of, of the prior courses, mine will be much more biological and applied and maybe even a little bit stranger for some of you depending on background. And so I wanted to ask one question of the people in this audience online, maybe I'll get another read. How many of you have taken like a physics of biology class before? Okay, a few. Oh, good. Almost everyone has. Great. Everyone has. Fine. Well, it's good I only wrote one lecture. Maybe I'll adjust. But we'll see how it goes. And so I'm hoping that these lectures will provide a gateway if you want to learn more and explore more, right? In particular in this area of viral ecology and evolution. So let me get started because what I'm going to do now is just embark upon a series of interlinked lectures, and I'll explain that in a few minutes, on the theme of viral ecology. And then next week, I'll do viral epidemiology. And I wanted to start the material. Obviously, this is not part of the material. This is an ad campaign for the world's most interesting man. Ever, anyone ever see this? Dos Equis. You can see the beer he's promoting. Uh, it doesn't matter. It was a silly ad campaign. But I wanted to contrast it with this very boring PowerPoint slide. So it's a very boring PowerPoint slide. Just a bunch of numbers, experiments, replica. And obviously, this doesn't have any of the bells and whistles. It doesn't have any animation. There's no colors. But I claim that this is perhaps the most interesting table in the history of biological sciences ever. Ever. Never seen a more interesting table. And part of the reason I think it's interesting, let, let's look across at one particular row, and hopefully that'll work. Let's look at experiment five. I haven't even told you what these experiments are, but you can see there's different replicas. You're redoing the experiment again and again. And sometimes you get zero, sometimes you get one, sometimes 107. And the numbers here are the number of colonies that are being counted on a particular uh, agar plate. So in some cases, you can find 107 colonies, sometimes zero. And if you can see anything here, you see that the experiments are basically non-repeatable. You do it again and again with this replica, and you get totally non-repeatable outcomes. And now I'll ask a different kind of question. Has anyone here ever done microbiology experiments before? One of you. OK. I'll ask that individual. What's your name? Manuel. Manuel. If you did a microbiology experiment and got these kind of results, would you be proud to share the results with your advisor? You don't think so? No, because it is turning out different every time. Right? So that seems like something we don't want to see happen. And I know biological systems are noisy, but this seems almost too noisy. Does anyone have any idea? I've given you a hint. These are bacterial colony counts. Has anyone ever seen this data before? Not, not you, Jacopo. You're not taking this course. OK, good. Uh, this may be the right course for you all if you haven't seen this before. Someone in the back? Was there? No? OK, not a guess. So these are taken although I've inverted the orientation, from this famous paper by Lurie and Delbrook, Mutations of Bacteria from Virus Sensitivity to Virus Resistance. And those numbers were the number of resistant colonies against viral infection. So you take a susceptible culture that should all be vulnerable to destruction lysis by viruses, and yet when you put it on this bacterial plate, you find that sometimes you get 107 resistant 
colonies. So founded potentially by a single resistant bacteria. And other times you don't find any. Right. And you can see that data column right there. And although this may seem somewhat banal, maybe even benign, maybe you don't care, I want to point out that the Nobel Prize in 1969 was given and credited in part for this experiment. And I'll explain why in a moment. Has anyone ever heard, but this is also helping me orient and get to, to know you all. Has anyone ever heard of this Luria Delbruck experiment before? How many have? How many have not? Okay, most have not. Okay, fine. And most of you answered too. I was going to ask the third category. Not sure if you have or have not, which is fine. Okay, so let me explain a little bit about how this experiment worked and why actually these results are quite interesting. So at the time before this experiment was conducted, there was a, really a fundamental, not necessarily misunderstanding, it was a lack of understanding of whether or not mutations were dependent or independent of selection. Okay? Meaning that a mutation, which is a change in the genotype of this bacteria, right, may be as a result of the experience of interacting with the environment. Right? Or it may be totally decoupled from interacting with the environment. So as, if some of you have understand the difference between like Lamarckianism versus Darwinian evolution, the idea would be in the classic example, the giraffe, the mother giraffe stretches out its neck farther to reach the acacia leaves. And be, the more it stretches, the more that its offspring will have longer necks. That seems, I, again, it seems preposterous. But that is the notion that the mutation might actually depend on selection. There was some experience, and therefore, whatever the difference in the genotype would have some property based on the experience. The independent one would be that the mother giraffe can stretch as long as she wants for the acacia leaves, and some of her offspring will have longer necks, and some may have shorter necks, and perhaps the ones with longer necks will be able to reach those leaves when they get older, and therefore, over time, that variation will be selected upon. Okay, so we have a notion of independent or dependent on selection. Okay. Good. So how do you actually go about thinking about testing this? How would we know? So Lurie and Delbruck devised this experiment together to try to test this idea with the, with the notion that you start from a population of susceptible bacteria that begin to replicate over time, starting from 1 to 2 to 4, and over log 2 of n to some population size n number of bacteria. And then you provide some sort of selection pressure, in this case exposure to viruses that exclusively infect and lyse this bacterial population, should eliminate them all. Right? This bacterial population is originally susceptible. And then you go and count to see how many of them have managed to survive and you do that by putting them on this bacterial plate and if they have somehow survived because they've resisted that then they should proliferate and make a visible colony that you can count. And those are those numbers, 5 and 107, et cetera, that you saw in the earlier example. Okay? If it were the case that a subpopulation of bacteria acquire resistance and survive viral infection, meaning that the mutation depends upon selection, then in some sense you're doing a coin flip experiment. Right? And we should have a Poisson distribution, because we have a probability, small probability, P, very, very small, of acquiring resistance. We try this many, many, many times, because n is a very large number, something like 10 to the 8th or 10 to the 9th, etc., if not more. And then you find a very small number of these resistant colonies. However, if you do this again and again, here I have an example of three. If I were to do this again, and it depended upon selection, how many would I expect the next time, do you think? Anyone want to hazard a guess? I observed three. This actually is an answerable question. I know it seems unanswerable. But if mutation depends upon selection, I have an observable, and I measure three, and I do it again, should it be a number close to three, very far from three? Here we say someone says three. Yes? Exactly three? You, you can, it's okay, you can uh, hazard a guess. Somewhere close to three. Do you want to hazard a guess? 
Is that yes for close to three or yes exactly three? Exactly three, maybe. But remember, there's some chance here because if I were to do this again, it may be a different set of bacteria that acquire this resistance, but certainly it would be a small, similar number, maybe four, maybe seven. It would be similar every time, right? Because if you think about the law of large numbers, and I'll give you the exact uh, derivation in a moment, then we have some probability p, then we have one minus p that it doesn't happen, and essentially we have either the binomial distribution, which becomes the Poisson distribution when n is very large and p is very small. And we don't have much variation between them, right? So we expect very similar numbers. Let me contrast that situation if mutations were independent of selection. If they were independent of selection, it's possible that very early, although this would be quite rare, and I've made a dramatic example for effect, it is possible that very early on in the proliferation process, in one of the early generations, there might have been a mutation from susceptible to resistant, and if this mutation did not have a significant cost in this particular growth environment, then that subpopulation would grow and grow and grow. And I've given this extreme example where half the cells happen to be mutants. And then when I expose to the viruses, the mutation is already there. And this is very important if you, as physicists, want ever to move into biology, not to think somehow that these mutations are purposeful. This one was there, you, I might never even expose those bacteria to this viral population. Right? But it was there already. And then when I go and I do this plate counting experiment, I find a very large number, a jackpot number of these resistant colonies. Okay? Now if I were to do that again and again, here let's say this was something like 107, obviously this is huge, this is n over 2. This, this would basically be al almost uh, unobservable with my dilution method. But in this case, if I re-ran this again, do you think the next time it would be similar or very different? I have a head shake. What does that mean? Similar to... Very different. Why? You have an instinct. It's, it's, the instincts are good. And I'm going to ask questions here, so... Don't be afraid if, if I go and, and try to engage with you, and it'll make the class more fun. Yes? It could happen at every step. So maybe it happened early. And the earlier it happened, it seems rarer that it happened because it's very low probability. But if it did, it has a very big outcome. And if it happens later, it would have a very small outcome, right? In fact, this is the extreme limit of it happening at the very end, in which there's almost no variation. But because now this could happen anywhere in between, we might get lucky. Right? and find it very early, or we might be unlucky and find it very late, and therefore we'd have very big uh, differences between the observable. This is why they did this very simple experiment. Grow overnight cultures, let them grow up, expose them to viruses, count the number of resistant colonies, and instead of measuring the average, they looked to see how different the numbers were. If mutations depended on selection, the numbers should be very similar, we should have a low variance. If mutations were independent of selection, the numbers should be very different. We should have high variance. And I hear I've done something where now I've formally written down the probability that we should actually observe M for a Poisson process in which each one is random and independent with some probability mu A for the acquisition probability of a mutation. Right. And this I haven't derived. I assume this crowd knows how to do this. But you can observe here where the number of mutations are on the x-axis, I put log scale, that it should be narrow. Whereas if we actually simulate a process in which mutations are independent of selection, we find this long tail that we can't reconcile. Right? And this is precisely what Lurie and Delbrook did, was look not necessarily, I think Manuel, was that right? They looked for irrep irreproducibility or the lack of repeatability was actually the hallmark signature, not the fact that the mean was low, because if you don't look at the variation, you might just get a different wrong estimate of the mutation rate. You're actually looking at the variation as the hallmark signature for this fundamental biological process, the fact that mutations are independent rather than dependent on selection. And I have to caution, there's always a, an exception in biology, 
Is anyone aware of, of instances in which biology does have this Lamarckian, the, the giraffe reaching out for the acacia leaves kind of effect in bacteria? Or do you, do you understand the question? I'm having puzzled looks, meaning I've just explained the Darwinian view with mutation or independent of selection. Has anyone ever heard of CRISPR, CAS? It's this big biotech thing, you know, people fight over billion dollar patents. Fundamentally, that's an acquired immune system in bacteria in which a bacteria that survives a viral infection can pull in a piece of that genetic material so that if they're ever exposed again, they start expressing these small little segments that essentially detect inside a cell, find matches and block infection. And that's sort of the bacterial analog of a giraffe reaching out for acacia leaves. And when doing so, its offspring have longer necks. Right? Nonetheless, for the bulk of what I'm going to talk about, and the bulk, I think, of the way you think about evolution, you should think about this as mutation being independent of selection. Even without selection imposed, we can see these pre-existing variants, which explains this variation and why the variation itself was the important feature. OK. So let me try to, again, this is my first lecture. So I'm trying to set the biological stage as I explore the way that we integrate models into understanding them. And I think you all can already see one of the consequences that viruses impose a strong selection pressure. Right? Meaning that in the absence of this mutation to resistance, th these viruses were able to obliterate nearly all of these cells except for a very few rare number of mutants. And obviously a mutation that confers resistance is beneficial. If you're able to resist uh, infection and lysis, that seems good. And therefore, in a fundamental sense, viruses induce host evolution. Right? The change, the heritable change in a genotype over, uh, over generations or over time. But what about the viruses? So this early example shows you that if I add viruses to bacteria, then we can end up getting this uh, change in the host population, we end up having a very different genotype composition afterwards than we did before. So Luria did a similar kind of experiment a few years after the first one with Luria and Delbrook. And just to get yourself oriented into these slides, the squares are phage, which are these viruses that affect bacteria. The rectangles are the bacteria. A solid line denotes infection, a dashed line denotes an evolutionary relationship, meaning there's a mutation that gets you from one to the next. And I think what you should try to take away from this is that if you look at the original viruses, they infect these bacteria, which then generate, just as the process I've just showed you, these resistant mutants. But if you then try to get the viruses to infect these resistant mutants, you can. And it's called a host range expansion. I mean, this virus's host range, which host it can infect, has expanded. And you can see that by the fact that the solid lines coming out of alpha prime include those of alpha, but include new ones. You can see to the side. And this is repeated in the one below. Yes? Correct. So this alpha prime can infect the same bacteria that alpha can infect, but it can also infect new bacteria. So its host range, which is the host that it is able to infect, and sometimes that's knowable, at least amongst the, this particular set of hosts that we have, can therefore expand. And you can see that both for the alpha type and the gamma type in those transitions. And Luria repeated this multiple times, but eventually came to a dead end found a host range in which it wasn't seemingly possible in the context of this experimental setup to find a virus that could infect this particular host, which suggested in some sense that there might be a mismatch or an asymmetry in the potential for evolution to drive both host and virus change. And this dogma persisted for decades. Here's one example the coevolutionary potential of virulent phage is less than that of their bacterial hosts. Meaning somehow maybe the hosts always have the advantage. They're ahead in the race, and they can in some sense escape the potential of the viruses to also mutate and infect new host types. And this also explains a little bit why 
Viral ecology, not viral epidemiology, but viral ecology, the study of viruses of natural host populations, in particular microbial populations, was not that active a field. You could always presumably find these bacteria that jumped away, so thought perhaps in nature that meant they weren't that abundant, they meaning the viruses. Until a few years later, something happened. So in 1989, Berg, working with colleagues, started to examine the abundance of viruses using a culture-independent method. They would go to aquatic systems, take the sample, stain everything that contained DNA, and look at it under the microscope and count. And in doing so, they found pictures like this. And you'll notice the scale bar. So we have a lot of one micron sized things, presumably bacteria. They're even bigger things, probably micro eukaryotes. And then these small circle-like things, which are about 50 nanometers in size and contain DNA. Is anyone aware of things in nature that are about 50 nanometers in size that contain DNA? <coughs> right, viruses. And what they did was essentially just count these numbers of circular virus-like particles, because at the time certainly they weren't quite sure they were viruses, called them virus-like particles. And based on how much water they had to add to the sample, they counted the number of these VLPs, these virus-like particles, we'll just call them viruses, and then back calculated, based on how often they would see these circular particles, how many viruses there should have been in, this, in the natural setting. And what they found was 250 million virus particles per milliliter in natural waters. And that's a lot. That's also true if you were to come back to Trieste and go out into the water, then maybe a little bit less, but you would find typically about 10 million virus particles per milliliter. This is a bit of a high number, but still on the order of 10 million virus particles per milliliter is not an atypical number, if not 100 million per milliliter near uh, productive coastal waters. And yet you go swimming and for the most part people don't get sick because these viruses are not necessarily viruses of humans, they're viruses of microbes. And what is also notable is that these levels were a thousand if not 10 million times higher than previous reports. So people have been going out into natural settings and measuring viruses and virus-like particles, they just weren't finding that many. And part of the reason, and the reason why I showed you those examples from Lurie and Delbrook, is that they would often take, not everyone, but some would take these samples and try to plate them on a known host. Maybe a Vibrio host, maybe even an E. coli host, and then try to measure the number of times that they found these small developments of bacteria in them and I should just point out that when I keep talking about this is an agar plate, and if you were to put bacteria on it and dilute it, you would find something like this. And you probably have all seen these examples of colonies, right? These are precisely the things that I keep talking about that Lurie and Delbert examined. You can do the same thing if we take an agar plate plus bacteria. So imagine now this is darker because it's full of these bacteria. And what I'm going to do, let me try to do this nicely, is now erase and make little holes. And this is actually not so different than what you would see. These are called plaques. These plaques are the proliferation, they're the phage equivalent of a colony. They're proliferation by viruses on a bacterial lawn. And so in the past, people have been using this method. They would take a known host, take their sample, filter out things so they just had viruses, do an experiment like this and try to count how many viruses they measure, presuming that just like one bacteria can form a colony, one virus can form one of these plaques, okay? But if you don't use the right host, then nothing will show up. And this explains why both A people might have thought that there was this 
less relevant viral impact, but that's not necessarily the case. They just may have been looking the wrong way. Okay? So that's just one example. Another example is that viruses aren't just abundant, they have other effects on bacterial communities. When a virus infects a bacteria, it lyses the host cell and out come new virus particles and also out comes things like dissolved organic material. So now you have new nutrients that might potentially be utilized by other bacteria in the system and so therefore we can think about viruses as not just agents of mortality but modulators of ecosystem functioning. And here you can see one quote, viruses divert the flow of carbon and nutrients by destroying host cells and releasing these continents back into this DOM pool and often these are studied in ocean systems, with perhaps the best studied of these viral ecological systems. So we have drivers of selection, agents of mortality, and also ecosystem functioning. But I also want to point out that going back into the early 2000s, very little was known about what these viruses were and also explains why if you did this kind of method, you might not have had success. The vast majority when one looked at the metagenomes of these viruses, their genetic content, you found that most of them were novel and unknown to science. And this is still in some sense the case, that we know far less about viruses, environmental viruses, than we do about the very small number of study viruses that are used often in molecular studies. Okay, so this is, gives you some sense that in the late 80s into the 90s and early 2000s there was a paradigm shift in terms of the interest uh, in studying viral ecology in part because they were both so abundant and yet still so unknown in terms of what, uh, who they were and what their effects might be. So what do we talk about when we talk about viruses? I think for the most part if you've studied uh, viral dynamics and certainly the last two years has told us many things, but it might have been Ebola or Zika, influenza, HIV, we usually talk about viruses that infect humans. And I recognize for the last couple years we've probably only been talking about that virus. Right. That will be next week's lectures. Right. Just to give you some preview, because of the nature of work in my group, we have been doing quite a lot on COVID-19 modeling and still are having a lot to do with foundations of models and what they say and what they can say about new kinds of reactions. And so I'll give you some sense of, of, of that kind of the mathematics and the nonlinear dynamics involved with that next week, both foundations as well as frailties. So what I'm hoping to do next week is to give you a sense of what we kind of get right about these kind of models and also what we get wrong and what COVID-19 revealed that we get wrong. But I will also try to show ways in which these same kinds of approaches can motivate action taking. And so a lot of what I've been doing in the past couple years along with colleagues is ramping up an asymptomatic testing program at Georgia Tech. We're approaching 500,000 uh, measurements, 500,000 asymptomatic tests and measurements trying to control spread on this open campus which opened up in August 2020 back to students and also developing ways to communicate that there might be someone near you who has COVID as part of this risk assessment dashboard, which has been expanded to many places, including in Italy, uh, Spain, Mexico, and elsewhere. So I will try to emphasize next week ways in which these basic models have gotten things right and also gotten things wrong, but also have motivated action taken. But these are not just the two extremes where viruses are making an impact. Viruses really infect organisms across the diversity of life from humans all the way uh, across different scales, including obviously plants, as well as microbes and bacteria. And I won't maybe belabor this interesting story, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with the very hungry caterpillar. You are, if you, if you, have, a, if you have a niece or a nephew, in my case I have children, so I, I re read this story, and this may be a U.S. thing, but I think it's been translated. Uh, so some of you may have... Who has never heard of a very hungry caterpillar? Never heard of a very hungry caterpillar. 
Okay, so I'm going to give it two minutes because I'm with you for nine days. And don't worry, we'll get to some technical stuff eventually. But the first lecture, I'm trying to introduce concepts. It's a very nice story that you want to read to a small child about a very hungry caterpillar who essentially explains the life cycle, how it turns into a butterfly, and in the process has to eat all this stuff. And what should be eating is nice green leaves. But of course, you know, it's a children's book, so it's eating a bunch of junk food. Right? And that's not really helping it, and eventually eats the nice green leaf. And then it obviously goes through its transformation, metamorphosizes into a butterfly. And it's a very nice story. But unfortunately, sometimes these leaves have little baculoviruses on them. And when the caterpillar takes a bite of this leaf, it also ingests baculoviruses, which begin to replicate inside these caterpillars, turning them essentially into zombies. And they start to act very strange and move up to an entire portion of the plant. And then they stop being caterpillars and basically become dripping, oozing viral factories. And eventually just slough off all these viruses and which fall down to another leaf. So this is sort of the horror version of the very hungry caterpillar. Where eating the leaf turns out to be very bad and this promotes junk food eating, etc. So you can listen or read more about this very interesting story about the life cycle of these baculoviruses. And in a broad sense, I'm trying to convince you in this first part of this lecture, is there really is a planet of viruses out there to explore. Right? Everything from viruses of humans to viruses of microbes and in between. Now, there's also a role for modeling physics, physicists, mathematics. And so what I'm going to try to do in this lecture, this first series of lectures, is to try to bridge and introduce different ways in which a nonlinear dynamics and really systems level approach can help us understand different facets of virus microbe interactions. And that's what I'll be doing this week. So today I'm going to try to explain some principles of ecoevolutionary dynamics and hopefully build to tomorrow where I'll talk about dynamics in complex communities. So today's lectures, today and tomorrow, will be linked. And then I will try to explain a different modality beyond which viruses infect hosts. I'm focusing today and tomorrow predominantly on this, what is called lytic route, by which there's a very antagonistic, lethal relationship between the virus and the microbial host. And then on Thursday, I will try to take these concepts and begin two series of applications. One, to understand in which one can use viruses as potential therapeutics. Obviously, that's not something that we often are thinking about. Now we're trying to have therapeutics against viruses. But for bacteriophage, these viruses infect bacteria if the bacteria is a pathogen. And the pathogen is potentially a multi-drug resistant pathogen. Then it may be possible to use viruses as a way to target, whether with or without or in combination with existing antibiotics, to try to eliminate a bacterial pathogen. So I'll talk about therapeutic applications on Thursday. And then finally, I will do more in the direction of model data integration. How do we learn about what's going on in natural systems with the focus on marine systems? Again, using these nonlinear non dynamics models as, as a chassis, but trying to figure out what we got wrong by, again, using a sort of more of a, uh, a model data inference approach. And that'll be Friday. So this week, I'm really going to focus on viral ecology in a sequence of linked lectures. And then next week, I'll restart and reset and do my viral epidemiology lectures. Any questions before I set sail, as it were? No? OK. Any questions from the chat? No? Nope. Fine. OK. So to get us started, I want to organize my lecture today really over three basic questions. And this will go from today until tomorrow, based on the pace I want to try to adopt. And I'm going to try to ask the question, how does viral infection change microbial population dynamics? Right, just fundamentally, how can we think about viruses not necessarily as only an outcome between one virus and one host, but how do we move that to the population scale? And then I will try to ask questions about evolution and even co-evolutionary change. Because we can't think about biological systems in the same way as we think about physical systems. The rules that we have at the start may not be the rules that we have at the end. These systems autonomously change their dimensionality during the course of their interactions. Right? They change their properties 
as they interact. And then I will try, I believe tomorrow, uh, given my timing, try to figure out more about interaction networks and, uh, and virus host interactions in complex communities where we don't have these small number of players that we might be able to realize or control in the experimental setting. Okay, so part one. How does viral infection change microbial population dynamics? So to do this, I'm going to go back to another intellectual course, which is the mathematician Vito Volterra and the physicist Alfred Laca, who independently uh, came up with what we now call the Laca Volterra or Volterra Laca, depending on your preference. I guess I should call it Volterra Laca here. Uh, uh, equations that describe predator prey dynamics. And originally, Volterra was inspired by son in law Umberto d'Ancona to examine fluctuations in Adriatic fisheries. The fact that there seemed to be these oscillations in the amount of catch, and wanted to understand something about the ways in which that variation might be generated endogenously, meaning intrinsic to the system, or exogenously, because perhaps there was some change in temperature or other factors that mediated from the outside. And what they both realized is that you didn't necessarily need an external driver of a system to find oscillations in that system. Right? That the interactions within the system would, in and of themselves, be sufficient to generate oscillations. And in modern terms, they proposed the following system of coupled nonlinear differential equations, which I assume all of you have seen before, or some of you. But it's okay. We're going to get started, and then we'll move a little bit faster. In this case, we have prey abundance and predator abundance, and you can see it's nonlinear because of the B times P term. And we have something in which we have prey birth, which that's A N term. There's predator consuming prey, that minus B N P, converting it into prey biomass or predator biomass or abundance, and then the death of predators in the absence of prey. And if you take these system of equations and simulate them, you end up getting these oscillations. And the oscillations have a particular feature. You should see that the prey peaks before that of the predator. As the prey peaks, the predator goes up, driving the prey down. As the prey is down, the predator declines. And then the prey increases again, and we have uh, a full cycle, which repeats. OK? And just so that you all do something in these lectures, and not just me, I wanted to ask the question, how do we anticipate the structural dynamics of this system near the fixed point? So I assume, again, you all know what a fixed point is, the system, a point in the system in which both n dot and p dot are 0. So you all seem to have some writing implement, whether electronic or a piece of paper. And what I'd like you to try to do, it should only take a few minutes for you to get started, is I'd like for you to try to draw out a little phase plane just in front of you, np, because this will help us when we make these models a little bit more complicated. And first of all, let's identify the fixed points maybe together. Does anyone see a fixed point in this system? Can you just go ahead, raise your hand, and tell me where one is at least? Zero, zero. zero. Right, if there's nothing there, there's nothing there. OK, good. We found one. All right. So zero, zero is one. I haven't said anything about its stability yet. Are there any others? OK, what was it? P equals A over B. OK, and that's something What we need to have the other part. Over here. OK, good. So I'd like you just to take a minute to refresh yourself on your own so that you're trying to get yourself oriented. How would you describe the dynamics in this phase plane? So everyone take a minute or so and just think to yourself, how would you even, I'm sure I plotted this and you could even just try to intuit, which is also OK, meaning if I start somewhere here, where do I go? If I started somewhere over there, where do I go? And obviously you could think about it very close to that fixed point. So if nothing else, I'd like you to try and just use your intuition and draw what you think an orbit might be using an arrow to denote the flow of time. Everyone understand the question? <laughs> 
that you're supposed to do? Just take a minute and try to do it on your own. Jacobo, is this the eraser of this cloth? Anyone need more time? You've written about it. People are still making an effort. So I'm going to give about 30 more seconds here. And if you're listening at home, wherever you are, you can try this too. For whomever is there in the internet. Who's ready for me to move ahead here and try to work through this together? You all need any more time? Anyone? No? OK. So first of all, we found these fixed points. How did that person from the front row tell us about these fixed points? We set these equal to 0. And you can see, because I factored them here, I haven't factored them, that if n is 0, p is 0, certainly that's a fixed point. And this is how you solve the other one. But I want to do a little bit more than that and point out that there's something called null clines. These are where one component of the system is 0, not the, all of the components. And you can see here that n will not change, the prey will not change, when p equals a over b. So I can draw this dashed line across. And this is the n dot equals 0 null cline. At this level, there should be no change in n. So if we ever cross this line, we can only go vertical. Right? So if we're at that point where our change can only be vertical. Right? Whereas there's another null cline, n equals d over c. It's the p dot equals 0 null cline. And if we ever cross this line, our change can only be horizontal. I haven't told you which way yet, but it can only be horizontal. Likewise, there's actually another null cline. When n is 0, another one was p is 0. Just to point out, you, you can't see them there. But this one, n dot is 0, or this is also the n dot equals 0 null cline. And this is the p dot equals 0 null cline. When null clines intersect, we get fixed points. Here is one where the n dot and p dot is 0 null cline intersect. We get a fixed point. The other one is right here on this corner. Here, there's intersections, but they're of the same null cline. So we don't have fixed points at those other two corners. OK? Now we can ask the question about what we expect in terms of the dynamics in this phase plane. Let's imagine we were to start over at this point. We can use these null clines to tell us, let's think first of all, is the dynamics of n whether or not n should increase or decrease at this point. Okay? So based on this, we have a minus bp equals 0, which is why we get this for n. So if p is ever higher than a over b, what do you think happens to n? Decreases. Say again? Decreases. Decreases. And that's true there. And that's also true there. Whereas, if we were to start below, if p is ever less than a over b, obviously, then it goes up. That's n goes up. So now I draw those arrows. Okay. We can now use the p dot equals 0 null cline. 
And we can see that P will be, the change in prey, uh, predator, excuse me, will be zero when n equals d over c here. So therefore, when n is larger than this null Klein value, what should happen to the change in predators? When n is larger, what should happen to the sign of this? Increases. Which means I can draw this arrow, and this arrow, and by analogy, this arrow, and this arrow. Which means that in these four quadrants, I know exactly the directionality of the flow. I put these two together. I don't have another color chalk, but I will just go like that, like that, like that, and like that. And if I were to connect these together, you can anticipate something like that, where the flow is counterclockwise. OK? Good. But now we haven't necessarily described or figured out what's going to happen here, because it's possible. What's an alternative version of a counterclockwise flow, by the way? Here I have one that makes a nice orbit. It could spiral. It, I haven't said if maybe it goes like that, right? And often biological systems do converge. This particular example doesn't look very convergy. But that's not to say that it can't, right? How would we know? There are a few ways to know. One of which would be to take the system and linearize it around this particular fixed point. And that would at least tell us whether or not we would spiral in or not. Right? I want to do one thing before I do that, but I, I am going to do that in a moment. I want to notice that this has a particular weird property. That if I take the ratio of dn dt over dp dt and I get rid of the dt's, you can see that we get an equation like this, which are separable. OK? Which means that I can draw out the dp to one side and the dn to the other, and can write these as follows. Which means that if I were to integrate and see how the differential of n goes with the differential of p and integrate both sides, we end up getting cn minus d log n equals a log p minus bp plus a constant. This means that there's some weird conservation law in this system. If I start with some combination of p0 and n0, and I add up this bizarre thing by going like that, right? if I were to just take cn minus d log n minus a log p plus bp, I would get some constant. And there, all the trajectories have to be like that forever, which would exclude the possibility of all of these things converging to this central point, because then that constant would no longer be preserved. In fact, what this particular system of equations says is that the initial conditions will be remembered forever, which in physics is great and makes you feel very comfortable, but in biology is often a sign that something's pathological and gone wrong. So with just this simple little feature, we can see that if I start off with a particular number of bacteria and viruses or a particular number of links in hair, we would somehow always be trapped on that orbit forever. And there would be an infinite number of these, all with this different crazy constant. Okay. Now, we can also reassure ourselves that if we'd had a small perturbation near this fixed point, we would not, in fact, relax to it. And there's another way for us to do that. And I, I feel I should do this because this is my first lecture, and I want to make sure we're all on the same page, which is 
I might be interested in knowing the dynamics, because most of you, I think, wanted me to start there. Right? That's your intuition here. Which is to linearize the system near the fixed point. So we have our fixed point. That's the one we're interested in, which is the coexistence fixed point. And we want to see what happens. But nonlinear dynamical systems are hard. And if we could turn them into linear systems, at least temporarily, we might be able to get a sense of whether or not they go up or down or not change at all. And that would help us potentially figure out between the spiral and between these orbits. Now, there's a formal process of doing it. But I just want to point out, because sometimes it's lost, which is that we can think of this value, n of t. There's a bit of an echo in this one particular location. n of t as being n star plus some perturbation, which is small. And p of t is equal to p star plus some other perturbation. I'll drop the t's in a moment, this little v. And therefore, because these are fixed, if I were to write The derivative, you can also see, I'm just saving board space, that the derivative of n is equal to the derivative of u, and the derivative of p is equal to the derivative of v. OK? Which means that if we go back to this original system of equations, we can write this as u dot equals and v dot equals. And in fact, there's just too much echo there, so I'm going to move over here. Does anyone know, do you need this anymore, or can I erase this? I think you all got this, and it'll show up in a slide in a moment. This puts me closer to where I want to be, and hopefully a little bit away from that echo point. OK, so what I can now do is begin wherever I see an n to replace, let me go back and just write it in that way. Wherever I see an n, I can just think of it as the fixed point plus the perturbation, and the same with the value of p. OK, so I can write this as n star plus u a minus b p star plus v. And what I can do then is group the terms together. So I can see for the a n, I have a n star. And eventually, I'm also going to have a minus b n star p star, right, that's going to show up as well. I'm going to have plus a u. And I'm also going to have minus b p star u. And finally, I'm going to have minus b n star v. I've missed one thing if you're paying attention. What have I missed? I think, you know, the chance of making an algebraic mistake here is high, but so far I haven't made one, I don't think. What have I missed? The end. Say it out loud. The end, the end one? The first this you? I have it there. I think I've got it. I thought you were going to tell me this u and the v. I haven't hit them together. So somehow, intentionally, I didn't hit the u and the v because I'm only interested in looking at this expansion to small order. I'm assuming u and v are very small, and I don't care for the moment, although this is an unusual example of it for various reasons, about u times v, which I'm going to assume is very, very small. OK? So what I'm going to notice here is that at the fixed point, a n star minus b n star p is 0, which means that I end up getting something like a minus b p star minus v b n star. OK, so I have a system plus, and I'll make it explicit, higher order terms of u squared, uv, 
V squared. Turns out I only have the UV here, but I'm going to eliminate those higher order terms, which I'm not going to worry about. So I've taken this nonlinear dynamical system, and now you can see the start of a linear dynamical system. The same thing for V dot. I can write this as, and I maybe now will avoid doing the whole expansion, but I can do the whole expansion, and I can write this as C n star p star minus d p star, which I know is all going to go away to 0, plus c p star u plus v c n star minus d. Odds of making a mistake here, very high, but I think I've avoided it. OK, so I can end up writing this all together, u dot v dot, in terms of a matrix that you should identify as the Jacobian, which I assume, who here is, assume everyone here has heard of a Jacobian before. I'm going to assume. If that's not the case, you don't have to tell me no, but maybe come afterwards and chat with me because I would like you to know what that is, and I can't do all that today. And I don't want you to have to put your hand out for that one. But if you feel like that, you can either talk to me or send me an email, send Jacobo an email, and we can give you a little primer if you want to get a refresher. But you can see here that what we end up having is the equivalent. And now if I were to write this as f of n comma p, and this is g of n comma p, all I've done is take the derivative of f with respect to n, the derivative of f with respect to p, the derivative of g with respect to n, and the derivative of g with respect to p. And in doing so, we have a system that originally was nonlinear, but we've turned linear. And I'll write it here. And now I'm going to plug it in at the value of the fixed point, right? Because I have to evaluate at this particular context. This A minus BP is precisely the condition for our equilibrium. So I have a zero there. And CN star minus D is precisely the value at the equilibrium point. So we also get a 0 there. And on these sides, we have b with n star, which is just d over c. And here, I have c times p star, which is c a over b. OK? Now, it turns out that when you have linear systems like this, we expect things to grow, decline, or somehow oscillate exponentially. So we posit that there should be some sort of ansatz that goes like e goes like e to the lambda t, u goes like e to the lambda t, same with v. There should be some exponential rate of growth or decay, or perhaps stasis in a particular sense. And if this is true, the only way for this to be the case is that the determinant of this Jacobian minus lambda times the identity matrix is equal to 0. But we have a strange feature. The trace is 0, right? which means that if we were to plug in our j and put these minus lambdas, these eigenvalues across our Diagonal, we end up getting lambda squared minus this stuff is equal to 0. In other words, is equal to, let me make sure everything cancels, a d, which means that lambda is plus or minus i times the square root, sorry, minus a d, a d. Did I miss a sign somewhere? 
I must have missed the sign somewhere in my madness. Where did I miss my sign? Yes, this one. No, where am I? Where am I? Yes, this this one. That's why. Good. That's why that didn't look right, but I corrected the sign here. It was inevitable I was going to make an uh, algebraic mistake somewhere. I'm, I'm surprised I got this far. So we end up getting something that has no real part, but has an imaginary part, which means that rather having a small perturbation grow in magnitude, which would imply spiraling out, or some sort of saddle, or both real parts being negative, which would have implied, as you suggested, a spiral in, we have something in which the magnitude doesn't change. And in fact, technically speaking, you should always check if your first order expansion doesn't work. You'd have to go to higher order. But we have already done it because we already solved it before, but I erased it, doesn't matter. This crazy formula, which I'm going to show in a second, which says that if you have a perturbation near the fixed point, that perturbation would not grow exponentially or decline exponentially. It would stick onto this closed orbit. Okay? And I assume you're going to... Uh, the next speaker will also be talking about dynamical systems and going through some of these concepts maybe in different ways in, in terms of chaos. And Fabio will be talking about that. But still, this concept of looking near a fixed point for the behavior of a system is going to permeate what we're going to do today and tomorrow into, into many, really most of, of, of the lectures. Okay. So what we have done together in this little series is identify that we have this counterclockwise flow but it doesn't converge. Rather, a linear stability analysis, which we just did, yields a pair of purely imaginary eigenvalues, real part zero, which means we have a conservative system. These aren't limit cycles in the sense that they, if we have an orbit, if we were to perturb away from it, it is not an attracting orbit. Right? So it is not isolated. It is next to an infinity of other orbits because of this pathology in the system. Okay? So, I took a long way, but I still wanted to make sure we're sort of on the same page with some of these basic mechanisms. If we start with the classic lock of Volterra model, we end up getting this conservative system that does not have a limit cycle. But once you start to introduce certain features, and that's some of what we're going to do in a moment with this virus microbe system, you find these generic features that prey peaks before the predator. They tend to be quarter phase lagged in terms of the oscillations, and that is why they appear counterclockwise in this plane. We have the prey peak, followed by the predator peak, followed by the prey trough, followed by the predator trough, and then the prey peak again. And that cycle is the thing that repeats. OK. I bring this up, and this was a long diversion. I'm pulling myself out of that particular alley, but explaining why we went in there. That the study of virus and microbes has essentially co-opted much of the both mentality and formalism of predator-prey dynamics. The idea is that the phage are the predators, and the bacteria are the prey. In 1961, Alan Campbell explained this concept of a simple predator. If a virulent phage, meaning this phage that can only infect and kill the bacteria, are mixed together, then dot, 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 this would happen. And in some sense, these early models, and I'm going to explain some in a moment, use these same ideas. And I'll explain them more in details in the next few slides. What are these models? The one thing I want to just preface this in terms of looking at ecological systems is that I think often, again, in physics, there's this notion that if we have a set of equations, that's the real world. We, we analyze them. We find conclusions. And therefore, we've learned something about the real world. Herbert Levine gave a lecture at Georgia Tech a number of years ago when he said he worked in high energy physics and he interacted with experimentalists. I don't know, what did he say, twice a year? Because he, he had his equations. If he solved something, then uh, they were going to be borne out. And then he switched into condensed matter. He had to visit more frequently. Then he got into biological physics maybe every week. And he said he got into cancer. He had to talk to them almost every day. Because these equations are not sacrosanct. Right? So we use them as a means to engage and look at experimental data. And they give us a way of thinking about these systems. Here is an example of a three-part system. And I'll explain the images in a moment. 
in which we have resources for the bacteria to grow on and viruses that grow on the bacteria. And let me explain each term. I'll give you a schematic in a moment. We're envisioning a context in which we have this open resource vessel that has constant volume. In comes resources with a density R0 at a rate omega, which is why we have this term there. Everything is being flowed out because we want to make sure the vessel doesn't overflow. Minus omega R, minus omega N, minus omega V. Then the bacteria can grow on the resources, which you can see as the minus gamma Rn, right, in that upper right portion, converting with some efficiency epsilon into new bacterial biomass. And likewise, the viruses interact by collision with bacteria. So we have this minus phi NV. It depends on both the concentration of bacteria and the concentration of viruses. And then have a burst size beta. So for every infected cell, we get beta number of virus particles out in a lysis event. OK? Good. If you take this system and you start, as I do, with a bacteria and resource only system, which is here at the top, what you can see is that if you add viruses, the viruses rapidly shoot up in this little model. And there are these oscillations. Bacteria go down because they're not limited anymore by the resources. In fact, the viruses are controlling their density. And because the viruses are controlling their density, there's actually more resources in the environment, whatever the limiting uh, sugar content might be, glucose, maltose, et cetera. If you project this in the phase plane, I know it's a three-dimensional system. I'm just going to look in two. You can see, again, these counterclockwise cycles for the same reasons, though these happen to spiral in. OK, so we take this Locke Volterra model, and we can start to use it as the basis for thinking about virus host population dynamics. But obviously, I'm missing some pieces here. Any questions about this model that I've put up? I'm going to give a couple other examples in a moment. Yes? Uh, can you maybe repeat what, what all the terms mean? Yeah. Sure. Resources, bacteria, viruses. These are the change of the spec to time. So it's a coupled system of nonlinear differential equations, and it's three dimensions. Omega is the outflow rate and the inflow rate. So everything leaves that are, is inside this chemostat, the resources, the hosts, and the viruses, just because we need to make sure we have constant volume and we're constantly putting in new resources. So Think of this as sterile media coming in without bacteria and viruses. It has a density of whatever the sugar content is of R0, and this it becomes plus omega R0. So in the absence of any of these other features, so if I'm just making media, all I would have is a sterile media. There's no bacteria in it, and it would be eventually in the chemostat R equals R0 would be my fixed point. But it would not be stable. And since only Manuel has done a bacteria experiment before, you would imagine if I put a little bacteria into a vat full of resources, they would increase. Right? Let me just explain the rest of the terms, and I'll take your question. So this, therefore, is the reduction. And you can use more complicated forms for the consumption that involve saturation. This one is unsaturated. And this converts with some epsilon rate from this carbon into the prey, either biomass or abundance. This is the lysis term. The reason why it shows up twice is because when a virus infects, then we've removed a, one virus particle from the media, but out come beta. And I've made it explicit because sometimes there'll be an internal state, in which case the release might come later. Yes? Uh, epsilon, and, and beta epsilon is the conversion rate from the uptake of resources into new, ba uh, new bacteria. And what was your other question? the number of viruses that come out from each lysis events, what we call the burst size. Fabio, did you have a question? Uh, a, a supply of resources from the what? Yes, yeah, so this is an example. Let me see if I have it here. I, I might have switched the order. And I'll go back. What I'm imagining here, we have a reservoir of resources for this simple example. 
in which the resources are being pulled in at this rate omega into this chemostat vessel, and then it's all going and pulled out. Right. So this is often the case even in, in open flow systems, even in a marine system where you imagine there's upwelling, there might be resources coming from some other environment, and so that also might uh, be an explanation for why we have that. But in these chemostat models, this is a controlled rate of in inflow from a, of a determined reservoir. Okay. In fact, I'll just stay on this slide since I'm here. This model really combines, and maybe this makes it more apparent, we have this media reservoir, we're pulling in resources, things are happening in a controlled temperature environment where it's being shaken, so we can think of it as homogeneous. And on top, it explains a little bit more about the details of how a virus infects and exploits a host cell. These viruses are passively diffusing in the environment. They come in contact with bacteria inject their genetic material, the viral genetic material, into the cytoplasm of the host. It begins to replicate and take over, first through a control process of taking over the host cell machinery, replicating viral genetic material, let's think about it as DNA, packaging that into and self-assembled capsids, and through a time process, through a release of a holin, which makes a hole in the inner membrane, and a lysin, which makes a cut in the cell wall, out come all these viruses. And so this beta, you can think of as the number of viruses that pop out. And it can be a number that can be as small as 10 or 15 or 20, oftentimes 50, 100, if not more. OK? Questions about this concept? OK. This does suggest, though, that maybe the model we had before was a little bit off. Because the model before says that as soon as we have infection, we have lysis. So here I've removed the resource layer for a moment just to focus in on what the dynamics might look like if we have an explicit infected class. Here we have a model in which we have susceptible bacteria, infected bacteria, and virus particles. These cells increase in abundance in some logistic-like fashion. In the absence of viruses, they would reach some saturating level. You'll notice here, I still have these minus omegas. We're still imagining that everything is being flowed out, but I'm not worrying about the resources right now. It's implicit in this value K. It would be the level at which bacteria would get to some carrying capacity within this chemostat environment. And it would depend on flow rate and R0 and other things, including the efficiency. We have infection, which removes virus particles from the media. But instead of immediately creating new virus particles, we now increase infected cells. Okay. These infected cells, lice at some lysis rate eta, producing beta virus particles. And just so I'm oriented, if the cells are lysing at a rate eta, how long on average is the period in which they're infected? One over what? One over eta? Yeah. And what is the typical time at which they're infected? Here's some time. You're saying that's how long they're infected on average. I think that's what you just told me. What is the typical time? If I had a stopwatch and could measure after absorption in this little representation, where should I put my typical time? Meaning if I have some distribution, where would it peak? No, beta is the burst size. So who here thinks it should peak near 1 over eta? Who here thinks it should peak over here, down near 0? Who here has no idea what's going to happen in this model, which you can raise your hand and that's OK, fine. OK, good. OK, good. Terrific. Wonderful. 
Let's just think about a process in which we have a probability per unit time of lysis in a unit time of eta, which means the probability of lysis in a little time dt is equal to eta delta t, right? The probability that I don't lyse in this time is 1 minus eta delta t, right? The probability that I lyse between time tau and tau plus delta t must therefore be I don't lyse between any of the time 0 and tau, which means I don't lyse in the time delta t, I don't lyse in the next da, 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 and I don't do that tau over delta t times. I don't lyse in any of those little small increments. I'm breaking up my time tau to tau plus dt, and I've broken them up into a whole bunch of increments, and I'm trying to ask, what's the chance I lice at that point? I shouldn't have lice beforehand. This is the probability I don't lice in a very small amount of time. I must do that n times, where n is tau divided by the little time increment, times eta delta t. This raised to tau over delta t is just e to the minus eta tau times eta, and I'll make a little differential dt. Right? I've just taken, if you think about what your Taylor expansion is, e to the minus eta delta t, the delta t's cancel, I get e to the minus delta tau, which means if you have a rate of leaving, this is just like a radioactive decay problem. I have a fixed rate of leaving. What is my residency time? It turns out it should be exponentially distributed. With mean 1 over eta, the rate, right? So this is the probability of lysis. But it has a very strange feature. It says that the typical time, the modal time, is actually 0. It's instantaneous. Whenever you see these rate processes, this will be leveraged quite a bit in my lectures, you should think of them as saying, you can think of it as the analogy of a stochastic process which is happening at some probability rate per unit time. And therefore, if I just have a first order process, my residency time in that state should be exponential. Okay? Does that help? I thought some, some people said that, had no idea, does this make more sense than it did a second ago when I just tried to ask that question? Good, I'm seeing nods. We're learning on day one, which is great. Now, that was a side thing, but I want to then pull it back into this. If you take this system of equations, including this explicit infected class, and you look then at the number of bacteria and the number of viruses, you get true limit cycles. You get, end up getting this counterclockwise dynamics, so they're exactly the reasons that Laco Volterra found them, except now instead of having a conservative system, you have one in which the initial conditions don't matter that much, and you end up converging to this limit cycle either from the inside or the outside. And you can see that in the red lines and the blue show you that they're not, that they are in fact isolated. There's not an infinite number of these closed orbits. Okay? Now, you might not like this model for the reason I just described. In fact, if you're a microbiologist, you really might not like this model because you know this is not the case. You know that it takes some time for viruses to assemble and to DNA to replicate. And you probably think that the timing should look more like this or even maybe sharper. This is one extreme limit, this exponential. The other extreme limit would be a delta function. There is a trick to turn this kind of model into this kind of model. It's called a linear chain trick, which I'll just mention as an aside, which is that if you ever are building these kind of little systems, you want to change the structure, the shape of the residency time. 
instead of just having one infected state, you could have two, where the rate goes twice as fast. The mean time stays the same, but now you've made something that looks gamma-like. Or you could make three, and the rate goes three times as fast. Or four, four times as fast, and eventually you're going to shrink down so that you'll keep moving instantaneously from one state to the other, and you'll get to a delta function limit when you have very, very, very large numbers of states. Or I could take the same system of equations, and now I've just put the boxes in red to denote what I've made different. And what I've made different is instead of having the viruses release immediately, I've written this tau notation to denote the fact that x tau is equal to x of t minus tau. So anytime you see a subscript tau, you should think of it as a time delay. This says that the viruses get in now, minus phi nv, they create infected cells. But infected cells lice based on how many new infections occurred tau ago. And that's why you get this beta times the adsorption rate times the, this collision, but tau ago. And you'll notice you have e to the minus omega tau. The reason why you have that e to the minus omega tau is that in the intervening time period, some of these infected cells were washed out of the system. How many? e to the minus omega tau, because the loss rate of infected cells is omega. So for the same reason I just explained this, we have to add an e to the minus omega tau here. Let's think of this works in the right limits. If tau were 0, we don't lose any. That becomes 1. And it just becomes our original model where basically we don't even have an infected cell class anymore. They're instantaneously released. If tau gets very long, then none of the cells that were almost essentially none of the cells that were infected a while back are present anymore to burst. They've already been washed out of the system. Any questions about this? This is called a time delay differential equation, or de delay differential equation. It is a bit nasty. I'll get your question in just one second, because we have to have initial conditions that are essentially an infinite number of initial conditions. Because in order to even start this model, we have to know the dynamics between 0 and negative tau before. Obviously, we can set those to 0, but it becomes a way of representing a more complex system of equations. Yes, here and then on the audience. Go ahead. Right. OK, good. Let me explain that, and then I'll take the question. This is the time from infection to lysis. And when I have something like an I class that has I dot minus eta I, this is the lysis we end up getting an exponential distribution with mean 1 over eta like that. This is a biological process. There's nothing wrong with this if it was radioactive decay. But in fact, in biology, it takes time to make these virus particles. In reality, there's probably no ability to make a virus particle, maybe for the first, in the case of many phage of E. coli, for the first five or 10 minutes after infection, you're just not going to find any virus particles. The timing is often controlled so that if I were to look at the probability, it would be much more likely to find it near the modal time so that the mean and the mode coincided rather than having the mode and the mean not coincide. So biologically, bio reasons, it takes time to build stuff. It should be more like that. This is an extreme version of that kind of distribution, which implies a delta function, a narrowing of that distribution. Question from online. Yes, so there is a question from the chat uh, on the original setting. So why did you remove the uh, resource R, and how do you include it? If you look in my book, I explain how to take a fast approximation. But in some sense, if you were to set the R dot is 0, you can make a quasi-stationary or an adiabatic approximation in which the amount of resources is controlled by the host. 
if you were to plug that value back in, you end up getting an equivalent value for k, which depends on some of these microscopic parameters. So it just also to illustrate this, it becomes a little bit un, uh, unwieldy, but essentially it has some of the same features. Not entirely, there are some subtleties there. So it's a good question. Here I'm just making an, a, an alternative uh, simplification. I'll give you the reference to the book as well, but you can essentially essentially set that r, uh, treat as a fast variable, set it to zero. Yes. I wanted to give the two extremes. Next week, I'll actually talk about something called generation interval distributions, which we'll talk about intermediate cases. And it won't actually be Gaussian. That won't be a good choice because it has a tail on the wrong side of zero. We, but uh, gamma would be good. Or an Erlang distribution, which is really what these are. Right. And I kind of gave you the, the example of how to do it by extending the number of I classes. And that's precisely how to do it. So I want to just maybe finish with one last point, and then I'll wrap up today. And I'll continue this lecture tomorrow. Is it an urgent question? Because I wanted to explain this. Uh, quick yeah. Uh, you did what n tau and n mu tau. Yeah. Can you explain which? Uh, the, the new set of equations. There are new equations. Yes. The only new one is tau, which you should think of as 1 over eta. It is the latent period. Yeah. Anytime you see the subscript, it means a delay different, a delay. I know I'm supposed to finish at 45. Sure. So uh, can I, do I have time to do one last thing? Because I wanted to logically connect it. I won't go farther than this. OK. Let me do one last thing. When can these viruses invade? It would seem that it should always work. The viruses infect hosts. They should always be able to proliferate. You could imagine a technique, and maybe we'll do it to start class tomorrow, or if you're interested, you can do on your own. We can imagine a system in which we start near the virus-free equilibrium. And part of the reason why, Manuel, I wanted to use these simple systems is I can make the point without doing too much algebraic work. And in fact, I'm even not going to do much algebra here. I'm going to do something more intuitive. You can imagine taking that system, finding the fixed point, linearizing the system, and checking for stability. And you would find that. The system in which we don't have viruses is sometimes unstable, which means viruses invade. And sometimes it's stable. Viruses are added, but they don't invade and proliferate. And it would be a bit algebraic, and you might not find it that satisfactory. But you should try it anyway to confirm what I'm about to explain. I want to give you an intuition, uh, a physical intuition as to the conditions that relate to these parameters to give them a little bit more life. Imagine we start with a single infected cell. This is a cell. This little squiggle denotes a virus genome inside. Okay. What are the fates of this infected cell? Fate one, it could be washed out. Right? Because if you see, there are two things that can happen to infected cells. They can burst or they can be washed out. It could then burst, and I, let me do that like that, where I now generate beta number of new virus particles. What is the chance that it washes out before lysis inside this reacting vessel? We have two rates. One is omega, one is eta. They're competing. What is the chance that the washout happens first? 
So we have a rate omega and a rate eta. This is lysis. I think you more or less have it, but let me just say it out loud. This is washout. If you're flipping coins, and I have two probabilities, or I have two rates in which two processes are happening, the probability that one happens before the other is just the ratio of one rate versus the total rates. So here we have omega over omega plus eta, and here's eta over omega plus eta. That's the probability we go down this path. We generate beta virus particles. Each of these particles itself has two fates. It could be washed out at a rate omega. Right? Here's this, so I can think of this as the eta rate and the omega rate. Here's omega. This one can absorb to a new cell. It absorbs at a rate phi n. Phi n star. Because originally, we only have the bacteria. Okay. If it does that, we've made a new infected cell. We've made a whole loop from infected cell to another. I have to apply that to every one of these viruses, because initially, we can think of the bacterial population as fixed. Therefore, I can ask the question, how many new infected cells do I get starting with one infected cell? Well, I should get eta over eta plus omega of the time I get a lysis event. Otherwise, I'm adding 0. If I get a lysis event, I multiply that by beta, because I make beta new virus particles. Of those virus particles, only phi n star over phi n star plus omega find homes, find new hosts. This probability times the number of virus particles times this probability of finding a new cell per virus particle should be greater than 1. If this product is greater than 1, it means that an initial infected cell leads to more than one infected cell on average. That keeps happening, and you have a proliferation. You can also think about it from the perspective of the virus particle. If I start with one particle, does my loop end up having more than one virus particle on average? In which case, I would say, what's the chance that you find a host cell for that one virus particle? What's the chance you survive to, in the infected cell to lead to lysis? And you generate beta new virus particles. Whether you think about infected cells loops or viral loops, you end up getting the same criteria. And since I'm almost done with time, you might want to try this on your own. This process of linearizing and checking for stability will also lead to a condition in which you either get a stable fixed point or an unstable saddle when this is true. But this is more fun because it has all the biological intuition and none of the algebra. So I've basically done all the work of calculating the trace and the determinant using the trace determinant diagram, and yet that's all there is to it. Okay, And now you have a physical sense of what's going on, whether from the perspective of cells, infected cells leading to one or more infected cells, or one virus leading to one or more infected viruses. If initially in the uninfected case, in the disease-free equilibrium, we generate more than one infected cell, more than one virus particle if we start with one, that process repeats, 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 and we get an exponential growth, which corresponds to viral invasion. Which also means traits that favor invasion include bigger birth sizes, higher ability to absorb, faster uh, lysis rates, all things considered. All of these things will favor interaction and also pointing out that the answer will depend on how well the bacteria are doing. If there aren't that many bacteria around, even if you're potentially a great uh, virus in terms of your viral life history traits, if the environment stinks for your host, it stinks for you too. OK. I think that's as far as I can get today. And I think my next slide is a whole new section. Uh, and I think I'll start with some of the, oh, actually, no, can I, can I do the, let me just do the last ones, because I'm finished with part one. 
I want to do, because I haven't shown you any data yet, but I want to show this last little bit. It's only one more minute. I'll be done right on time. And I'll start with this tomorrow as well. In the late 90s, people built these chemostat experiments and looked at these same kinds of oscillations. And I'll start with this tomorrow, showing that you can get endogenous oscillations in chemostats without any external change. And here you can see the virus host oscillations are changing on the order of two or more orders of magnitude over about a seven or eight day experiment. And they have that same feature that the virus are peaking after the host peaks to the extent to which this data is resolved. And this is all being driven by the interactions between the viruses and the bacteria. So to summarize, and this is part one, these original models of virus host dynamics presume a simple predator-prey-like relationship, very similar to Lock and Volterra. In these models, we expect there to be these virus peaks followed, excuse me, host peaks followed by virus peaks, leading to the host decline followed by viral decline. And it's the endogenous interactions that drive it. We can use simple principles of invasion to understand ways in which the life history traits make a difference so that not every virus that can infect a host can proliferate in a particular environment. In other words, the invasion is not inevitable. And tomorrow I'll pick up and begin to expand this beyond populations into evolution and beyond. So that's it for today. Thank you. So we have time for questions, if any, from the chat. No? Yes, there is a question. In, in these two last models we just saw, uh, we could infer that we could uh, find uh, limit cycles to our um, as a system. My question is, do we have only a single one uh, limit cycle, or could we get more than one? I see. In these systems, we get a unique limit cycle. That's a good question. I, I understand it. Yeah, in some other systems, I, I, I get that there could be other more arcane things happening. But this system has a, a single absorbing limit cycle. Yeah. Other questions? OK, so we can uh, right. take our break for 15 minutes. And we'll be back at uh, 11 for the first lecture by Fabio Ciaffoni. <laughs>